the NATO summit in Brussels. Mr Speaker, I know that members from both sides of this House would like to join me in paying tribute to Lord Carrington, who died on Monday. His was an extraordinary life of public service, including as Defence Secretary, Foreign Secretary and Secretary General of NATO. I am sure, too, that members on all sides would also wish to commend the incredible efforts of the authorities in Thailand and the volunteers and the volunteers from the British Cave Rescue Council for their role in the successful rescue operation. We wish them and we wish the boys and their families and the coach who were rescued well, and I know we would all wish also to offer our condolences to the family of the Thai diver, Saman Gunan, who sadly lost his life during the rescue operation. Finally, sir, I am sure that all members, whichever part of the United Kingdom they come from, would join me in congratulating Gareth Southgate and the England team for their, for their fantastic performance in the quarterfinals on Saturday and in wishing them the very best for this evening's match against Croatia. And I will happily buy the Right Honourable Lady Member for Islington South a flag to help to her join us um, in, in addition. In addition to my duties in this House, I have had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others and will have further such meetings later today. Chris Stephen. Thank you. Mr Speaker, as someone who supports the principle for, as for independence for England, I have no problem in supporting England. Yeah. Can I thank the Secretary of State for his role in helping secure a public inquiry into contaminated blood? My constituent Cathy Young and many infected blood campaigners, however, remain concerned that the inquiry will be delayed, like chill caught, by those who may have a case to answer through the maximisation process. So does the Secretary of State agree that truth and justice should not be delayed, and will he commit to the Government looking at legislative changes to the maximisation process? Yeah. 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 Well, Mr Speaker, I want to start by saying this is, of course, a tragedy which has caused unimaginable hardship and pain for the people affected. And let me say straight away that we also recognise the hard work that the Honourable Gentleman and other small political parties here have put into campaigning on this issue. Now, in, in relation to the specific issue that he raises, I'm sure he'll understand that whether or not the inquiry adopts a maximisation process is a matter for the independent inquiry itself. It is, as, as the term says, independent of ministerial direction. But I do know, having talked to Sir Brian Langstaff directly, that he and his team are very mindful of the need for speed. Victims of infected blood continue to die, and I know that Sir Brian is determined to complete the inquiry's work as quickly as a thorough examination of the facts allows, and the Government is committed to ensuring that the inquiry has all the resources and everything else it needs to complete that task as rapidly as possible. Mr Nigel Evans. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. As a proud Welshman and a proud Brit, I say come on England too. Um, crime is on the increase in the uh, Ribble Valley, including anti-social behaviour orders. Uh, but the response from the uh, Labour-controlled Police and Crime Commissioner is to close front services at police stations, including Clitheroe Police Station. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that you do not better protect the public by degrading the service that they pay for? Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, my honourable friend is right to say that the accessibility of local officers is a vital principle of British policing. And uh, he will know that we have provided a strong comprehensive settlement that is increasing total investment in the police system by more than £460 million in this financial year. And for Lancashire Police specifically, we have provided more than £6 million for 2017 to 18. As he says, decisions about resources, including the use of police stations, is a matter for police and crime commissioners and chief constables, but I'd encourage those who make those decisions to listen to their local communities to best assess their needs. Before I call the Honourable Member for Islington South and Finsbury, I should mention that we're very fortunate today to be joined in the public gallery, one of our galleries, 
by two members of the Osmond family. Yeah. Jay and Merrill Osmond. It takes some of us back to the 1970s. We're very pleased to have you. Well done. Emily Thornbury. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Minister of State in paying tribute to Lord Carrington, who served his country with such distinction in both the forces and in government, and whose decision to resign the office of Foreign Secretary will be remembered as an act of great principle and honour. I share the joy at the rescue of the boys in Thailand and salute the bravery of, uh, and sacrifice of the diving teams, including the seven British divers. On the question of tonight's match, I'm afraid I'm not going to be watching it. It will be the only game that I've missed, but I will be representing the Labour Party at tonight's memorial event for the anniversary of the Srebrenica genocide, something very close to my heart, given my father's role in trying to prevent it. But let me wish Gareth Southgate and the English team the best of luck for, the mat for this match and hopefully for the final on Sunday. Yeah. I may know very little about football, but even I can see that England's progress so far at the World Cup shows what can be achieved when all the individual players work effectively as a team. <laughs> There's a clear game plan, and when they're all working, working together, and of course, when everyone respects and listens to the manager. <laughs> so, can I simply ask the Minister of State what lessons he thinks the England team could teach this shambles of a government? Yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I think that. Uh, the, the England team has, does teach some good lessons, which is about the importance of having a clear plan, which the leader, which the team, which the, which the team captain has uh, the full support of the squad in delivering. And we will, of course, be publishing tomorrow full details of the United Kingdom plan for Brexit, which we will be putting to the British public and to our 27 European partners. When the Honourable, Right Honourable Lady gets up again, perhaps she will tell us what the Labour Party's alternative plan is, for at the moment that is one of the best kept secrets in politics. Emily Thornbury! Well, I thank the Minister of State for that answer, but who does he think he's kidding? Even Donald Trump can see they're in turmoil, and he hasn't even got to Britain yet. But can I ask the Minister of State once again, as I did at PMQs back in December 2016, when he compared Labour's shadow cabinet to Mutiny on the Bounty, remade by the Carry On team? Well, by those standards, what would he describe his lot now as? Perhaps Reservoir Dogs, remade by the Chuckle Brothers? <laughs> to our first PMQs in 2016, when I asked him how it was possible to retain frictionless trade with Europe without remaining in a customs union. I got no answer then. Let me try again today. Can he explain how the frictionless trade is going to be achieved under this government's checkers plan? Well, the, the, the Honourable Lady will see the detail in the White Paper, but if she had been listening to my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, on Monday, she would have heard the Prime Minister explain very clearly that we believe a combination of the common rule book on goods and on agri-food, coupled with the facilitated customs arrangement that we are proposing, will provide just that. And what is more, that takes full account of the wish of United Kingdom business to ensure that that frictionless trade will continue. Now, if the Honourable Lady, right Honourable Lady disagrees, will she stand up and say what her alternative proposal is? I do thank him for that answer on the Chequers free trade proposal, but I was hoping today that he would go beyond the theory and explain in practice how it works. So let me check one specific but important point for the Chequers proposal to work in practice based on what the Prime Minister said on Monday. Not just the UK, but every EU member state will have to apply the correct tariff to imports depending if they are destined for the UK or the EU. 
and then will have to check track each consignment until it reaches its destination to stop any customs fraud. Now, if that is correct, can I ask the Minister of State what new resources and technology will be required to put that system in place across the EU? How much is it going to cost? Who is going to pay? And how long is it going to take? No, I'm afraid the right honourable lady is incorrect in her assumptions. I mean, for a start, the customs model that we are proposing would not, under the arrangements that we suggest, affect either imports or uh, exports involving this country and the European Union. Uh, they would not involve exports from this country to the rest of the world. We are talking about imports to this country from non-EU member states. And our calculation is that when, in particular, you look at the importance of those sectors where um, either zero tariffs or very low tariffs already exist under World Trade Organization arrangements, or where finished goods are involved and therefore it is easy to identify the final destination, that we will find 96 per cent of UK goods trade is going to pay the, either the correct or no tariff at all at the border. Emily Thornbury. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, so the Minister of State, I believe, has said something quite interesting, and I do hope that his backbenchers are listening very carefully. So he says that the Chequers free trade proposal will require no new technology and will involve no tracking of goods. But how can that be possible if there is no divergence on tariffs, no divergence on regula regulation? In other words, one trade on trading goods, we will continue exactly as we are at present. Uh, the, the, I'm afraid the, the right honourable lady um, might not have sat through all of the Prime Minister's statement in response to questions on Monday, but my right honourable friend Lane made it very clear that we are actively looking uh, in these new circumstances, but frankly we would, as a sensible government, be looking anyway at the opportunities that new technology offers and will offer in the future to minimise friction on trade for businesses of all kinds. Emily Thornbury. The Minister of State cannot answer these simple questions of detail because he cannot admit the truth. The truth is that the Chequers proposal is total delusion. The UK cannot set its own tariffs on goods and keep frictionless trade with the EU. The technology to do so does not exist. So there will be no divergence on tariffs in the free, free trade area, no divergence on regulation. It is a customs union in all but name. But, Mr Speaker, it does not cover our service industries because the government claims that this is the great area of potential to negotiate trade agreements with the rest of the world. But can I ask the Minister of State to explain why a country like China would agree to import more of our services if it cannot agree in turn to lower tariffs on their goods? No, the, I think, first of all, I, I, I do think that the, the Right Honourable Lady has misunderstood still the customs arrangement we are proposing, and I would advise her to look at the white paper when it's, when it's published tomorrow. The reason, why, the reason why we are proposing to treat services differently is that it is in services where regulatory flexibility matters most for both current and future trading opportunities. And it's also the case that while the EU acquis on goods has been stable for about 30 years, the EU acquis on services has not been, and the risk of uh, unwelcome EU measures coming into play through the acquis on services is much greater. Emily Thornbury. Well, Mr Speaker, I have asked the Minister of State why China would accept such a one-way deal on services, and the answer is that they would not. It is a simply another Chequers delusion, a Brexit deal d dream with no grip on reality. And there is an easy answer to this mess, an alternative that will offer all the benefits of the Chequers free trade area, with no new technology, no cost, no delay, an alternative that both this House and Europe will accept, and an alternative covering both goods and services. So can I appeal to the Minister of State to accept that alternative, do what I urged him to do two years ago, and instead of trying to negotiate some half-baked backdoor version of the customs union, get on with negotiating the real thing. 
Mr. Speaker, um, again the right honourable lady uh, keeps silent about what the Labour Party is actually proposing. And the truth is, order, order, order. I want to hear the Chancellor of the Duchess reply. I say in the most genial possible spirit to the Honourable Lady, the Member for Lincoln, that she is allowing her blood pressure to rise unduly. And I say in a humanitarian spirit, (laughs) calm yourself and let us hear the ministerial reply. Minister. Mr Speaker, the party opposite says that they would strike new trade deals, but their plan to stay in the customs union prevents that because it would bind us to the common commercial policy for all time. They say, they used to say, that they'd control our borders, but they backed an amendment to the withdrawal bill to let freedom of movement continue. And the Labour Party used to say that they respected the referendum result. But now they are toying once again with the idea of a second referendum. The Labour leader won't rule it out. The deputy leader won't rule it out. The shadow Brexit secretary won't rule it out. And nothing could be better calculated to undermine our negotiating position and lessen our chances of a good deal than holding out that prospect of a second vote. And whichever side, whichever side, Mr Speaker, any of us campaigned on in that referendum, the country made a decision and we should now get on with the task in hand. That's what the government is doing. Emily Thornbury. Mr Speaker, the Minister of State seems to argue that by leaving the EU, the, the British people voted against a customs union. But that seems to be completely the opposite to what he used to say. I mean, I had taken back to 2011, and when he said that the yes-no referendum would not give us the information that he said, and I quote, that sharp this division between the status quo and quitting the EU does not reflect the breadth of views held in this country. For example, he said, if people voted to leave the EU, would that mean having no special relationship with the EU, or would it mean a relationship like Norway's? Now, he said it. My question is, we, we understand what he's saying, but when did he stop agreeing with himself? If I fear when we look back on this week as one where the government could have taken a decisive step towards a sensible, workable deal to protect jobs and trade, but we have ended up with them proposing a dog's Brexit, which will satisfy no one, which will not fly in Europe, which will waste the next few weeks and will take us in Thank you. closer. The Chancellor of the Duchy. Thank you. No, I think we've heard it. I think we've heard order. order. I, I order. To be fair, I order. But, uh, to be fair, I think we've heard it, and we've heard it fully, and that's really absolutely right. The Chancellor of the Duchy. Yes. Mr. Mr Speaker, I mean, the, the, the Right Honourable Lady uh, gave away her misunderstanding. Her question seemed to imply she thinks Norway is actually in a customs union with the European ah. Union. It's not. Um, the, what we have on the table from the Government is a comprehensive set of proposals that we believe will deliver for British business in terms of frictionless trade and will deliver on what people voted for in the referendum to restore to this House control of our laws, control of our borders and control of our money, and to achieve a new security partnership with our European neighbours that it is in the interests of every European country to achieve. That is something which the Right Honourable Lady should get behind us and support and work in the common interest instead of carping from the sidelines. Andrew Andrew Rosendale! Rosendale. (laughs) My right honourable friend will be aware that in London we've experienced a 377% increase in moped crime in the last two years. As the Mayor of London has so failed to tackle crime, Will my right honourable friend ensure that the government intervenes to make London the safest city in the world? Mr Speaker, let me say to my honourable friend that um, reports of crimes involving motorcycles, mopeds and scooters are clearly a concern. We have been working with the police, industry and other partners to develop a comprehensive action plan to focus on what works 
and what more needs to be done. And the police are now using new tactics, including off-road bikes and DNA marker sprays, to catch those committing these crimes. My right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, is now consulting on proposals to give greater legal protection to police officers pursuing offenders. It takes action to secure a reduction in these crimes, not just a press release from the Mayor's office. Action is what this government is undertaking. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today is the 23rd anniversary of the Srebrenica genocide. Yesterday I witnessed the heartbreaking testimony of two survivors of these heinous crimes against humanity, Dr Ilyas Pilav and Nusreta Sidac. Today, we all must remember the victims who were tortured, raped and murdered. Will the Minister join with me to remember those victims? And will he commit, on behalf of the Government, to bring forward a debate before the summer recess to put on record our united position that we can remember and debate what measures we can take to help make sure that genocides such as this can never be allowed to happen again? Mr Mr. Speaker, the right hon. Gentleman reminds us that uh, the horror of Srebrenica 23 years ago should remind us all of the intolerance that still exists in the world and of why there is a duty on all of us to do what we can to confront and overcome it and promote genuine reconciliation. I, my right hon. Friend, the Leader of the House, will have heard his request for a debate. I hope the whole House will also, while remembering the appalling tragedy of Srebrenica, take some heart from the fact that yesterday's Western Balkans Summit in London, bringing together the leaders of all Western Balkans countries in a spirit of cooperation and reconciliation, demonstrates that we have moved a long way in 23 years, but the right hon. Gentleman is correct. We must never become complacent. We must always be aware of the need for continuing work and effort. In Blackford. Speaker, can I thank the, the Minister for his response? Anniversaries such as these should remind all of us of the dangers of extreme bigotry. The world that we live in today is a dangerous one. Tomorrow, the President of the United States of America will regretfully have the red carpet rolled out for him by this Conservative government. But from the public, the welcome will be far from warm. With protests planned across Scotland and the United Kingdom against President Trump's abhorrent policies and dangerous rhetoric, will the Minister follow the SNP's lead and challenge President Trump on his abysmal record on human rights, his repugnant attitude towards women and his disgusting treatment of minorities? Or does the Minister think he will simply follow the Prime Minister's lead and join the President hand in hand? Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, no, Mr Speaker, I, I do disagree with the Right Honourable Gentleman on this. Um, this country's relationship with the United States of America is uh, probably the closest between any two uh, democracies in the West. It has lasted uh, through Democrat and Republican presidencies alike and through Labour and Conservative premierships on this side of the Atlantic. I would say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, because of the security cooperation uh, that we have with the United States, there are UK citizens who are alive today who might well not be alive had that cooperation and information intelligence sharing not taken place. And it is therefore right that we welcome the duly elected president of our closest ally, as we shall do tomorrow. Julian Sturdy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. There is growing concerns in my constituency about the proposed planning change or planning powers changes to for fracking applications being put forward for consultation by the government. Specifically, Mr. Speaker, the idea of treating non-fracking <laughs> shale exploration as permitted development. So, could my right honourable friend update me on when the consultation will be open, and does he also agree with me that these kinds of planning applications must? must come forward on the basis of local authority consent. 
Mr Speaker, uh, as well as friend knows, uh, shale gas has the potential to boost economic growth and support thousands of jobs across a number of sectors, as well as adding to this country's energy security. And the government has outlined how we believe shale gas planning decisions should be made quickly and fairly to all involved. We are committed to consulting on further shale gas planning measures. Those consultations are planned to open over the summer, and I want to reassure my honourable friend that these decisions will always be made in a way that ensures that shale can happen safely, respecting local communities and safeguarding the environment. Mr George Howarth. The artificial pancreas, which is championed by the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, has the potential to transform the lives of those with type 1 diabetes. Will the right honourable gentleman agree to look at ways to increase access to diabetes technology, including the artificial pancreas and continuous gl gl glucose monitoring, so that everyone with type 1 diabetes will have access to the best available technology? Uh, can I first say that um, I want to recognise the work that the right honourable gentleman personally has put into campaigning on this issue, and I am also aware of you know, the personal experience uh, that he has of the devastating impact this condition can have on families. I want to reassure him that the Government is committed to promoting the best possible care and treatment for people with diabetes as a priority. The National Institute for Health Research Biomedical Research Centre in Cambridge is pioneering the development and use of the artificial pancreas. And the prototype system is currently now being tested by people in their own homes. Now, I understand that the National Institute for Health Research Infrastructure supported more than 100 new studies and recruited almost 38,000 patients to help with those studies. So that work is ongoing to test the efficacy of the artificial pancreas. And I shall certainly draw the right honourable gentleman's comments and his campaign on this issue to the attention of the new Secretary of State for Health. Mr. Simon Hall. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we enjoy the summer weather, it does, of course, present challenges to our farming community. Will my right honourable friend join the National Farmers Union and me in calling for people not to use sky lanterns, preferably ever, but certainly not during such a tinder dry harvest? Our food producers do deserve our support. My honourable friend raises an important issue, Mr. Speaker. Can I first say um, we, I'm sure we'd all want to salute the incredible work of the firefighters, the military, and other partner agencies in responding to the wildfires that we've seen in various parts of the country in the last couple of weeks. But I want to encourage all organisers of summer events to exercise caution in this hot climate, to follow Home Office guidance on outdoor fire safety and take steps to prevent the risk of fire from lanterns and fireworks. And I would also encourage organisers to think both about the fire risk but also about the uh, impact that debris from lanterns has had on farmers' livestock in too many cases. Dan Carden. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Since the collapse of Carillion six months ago, the new Royal Liverpool Hospital now stands unfinished and empty a monument to corporate greed. Hospitals are for treating the sick, not lining the pockets of investors. So instead of waiting for commercial lawyers and accountants holding secret meetings with no public accountability, will the government now call in this contract, buy out the investors and deliver a publicly owned, publicly run hospital for the people of Liverpool? Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to reassure the honourable gentleman we are absolutely committed to getting the Royal Liverpool Hospital built as rapidly as possible and securing best value for money in doing so. And we're supporting the Royal Liverpool and Broad Green University Hospitals NHS Trust in that work. I do not think, though, that what the honourable gentleman advocated, which was to buy out the interests of the banks who have lent money to this project is the right approach to take. That would encourage irresponsible lending in the future against the prospect that there would be a government bailout down the line. And I think it is important that risk is seen to lie 
with the banks, with the lenders, and not be underwritten by the taxpayer. Now, we're working with the Trust actively and with the existing private sector funders to see if we can find a way forward for them to complete the remaining work on the hospital. And Mr Speaker, we hope this work will conclude in the very near future. I have known the Right Honourable Gentleman Member for Aylesbury for over 30 years, so I fully understand that the comprehensiveness of his replies reflects his past distinction as a noted academic, but I just gently make the point that I'm determined to get through the questions on the paper. Mr Alberto Costa. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Given the NATO summit this week, will my right honourable friend reassure me and my South Leicestershire constituents that this government will continue to see NATO as the bedrock of Britain's defence, given the range of threats that this nation faces, including the appalling use of NERG agent agents on British soil. Um, Mr. Mr Speaker, uh, first of all, as far as this government is concerned, NATO is and will remain the bedrock of our collective security, and certainly the threat posed by Russia will be one of the subjects that the Prime Minister and other leaders will be discussing at their summit yeah. in Brussels. Um, I just reflect with regret on the fact that the Leader of the Opposition has said on the record he wishes that we were not part of NATO. Um, the, the use of nerve agents in this country is appalling and uh, impossible to excuse. The police continue to investigate uh, the, uh, the, the, what happened, what, uh, how that uh, attack was caused. And the government is also fully committed to supporting the region and its residents, and we've announced new financial help to Salisbury and the surrounding area today. And we're streeting. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, until she was raped at the age of 18, my constituent led a healthy and happy life. Since then, she suffered severe post traumatic stress disorder, seizures and blackouts, panic attacks, anxiety, and depression, heavily reliant on her mother's care. The Department for Work and Pensions has refused to award her the enhanced rate of personal independence payments on the basis that when she presented for her assessment, she wasn't demonstrating these particular symptoms at the time. Can I, and as a result, her mother is unable to claim income support and carer's allowance, placing financial hardship on top of severe emotional distress. Can I ask him to arrange a meeting for me with the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions? Because what my constituent has experienced is, I'm afraid, another example of what we see Absolutely. week in, yeah. week out yeah. in our surgeries, which is the cruel and inhumane consequences of this government's welfare yeah. policies. Yeah. Well, I know that the, the Honourable Gentleman has campaigned on the issue of DIPG for some time, and I, I think the whole House would want to offer sympathies which I certainly share to his constituent and anyone affected by this appalling condition. I will certainly draw to the attention of the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions the points that he has made, and I am sure that a meeting will be arranged for him with either the Secretary of State or one of her ministers. Dame Cheryl Gillan. Mr Speaker, every MP will have around 1,000 people in their constituencies that are on the autistic spectrum and who will suffer from anxiety and, in crisis moments, often will not know where to turn. Mr Speaker, we're all familiar with this expression around here, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. So this week sees the launch of Molehill Mountain, a free, groundbreaking smartphone app which has been developed by the charity Autistica and will help autistic adults manage their anxiety. Will my right honourable friend join me in welcoming this fantastic new app which could help many people successfully manage their fears? Yeah. Um, Mr Speaker, can I first of all commend my right honourable friend for the work she continues to do through the all-party parliamentary group on autism to lead the campaign for better, more effective care for and support for people who have autistic spectrum disorders. I think that the uh, changes to the special educational needs and disabilities system that came in four years ago have enabled us to join up uh, state-provided services more effectively than in the past, but I am more than happy to welcome this new app that she mentions and any other new technologies that will help people with autistic spectrum disorder. 
Darren Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Information Commissioner has fined Facebook for its involvement in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, and the Electoral Commission has concluded that the Leave campaign broke electoral law. Is now not the time to set up a judge led inquiry into the Brexit referendum? Because if the British people have been duped by Brexit shysters, they deserve to know about it. Um, Mr. Mr. Speaker, so far as the Information Commissioner's report is concerned, the, obviously this has only just been published, and the government will want to consider the report and its recommendations uh, in detail before responding. But I think but the, the point he, he made focused upon the possibility of criminal offences having been committed. Now, rightly, we are in a country where it is not for ministers either to initiate or to stop criminal investigations or potential prosecutions. Where there is evidence, that should be drawn to the attention of the police and the prosecuting authorities, and then let the law take its course. Julia Lopez. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I do not consider myself a Brexiteer, but two years ago I was asked to make a choice about the future direction of the country I love. I voted to leave the EU, knowing it would be difficult, but believing our nation could make it work. I was not alone and am now joined by those who vote to remain who wish to respect our democracy. Will my right honourable friend agree with me that across our continent people are feeling dangerously ignored? And if democracy is to mean what we all thought it did, tomorrow's white paper will show that we in Britain at least will not deny the instruction our people have given us. Yeah. Well said. Am I, my honourable friend, my honourable friend is, is, is right, and I, I think that you know. Those of us who campaigned on on the Remain side do need to respect the decision that the people of the country took and to ponder the damage that would be done to what is already fragile confidence in our democratic institutions were that verdict to be ignored. I am confident that when my honourable friend reads the White Paper tomorrow, she will see that we have a vision for a future relationship which meets the uh, vote that the people delivered. Julie Cooper. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am sure that the Minister will want to join with me in thanking hospices across the country for the fantastic work they do supporting the terminally and their families, uh, and especially the Pendles side hospice that supports my constituents. But is he aware that over the last eight years, average government grants have been cut from 32% to 20%? And is he also aware that as these charities are outside the agenda for change, they are not eligible to apply for funding to cover the NHS pay award. Will he today commit that the government does value the work for hospices and will he step in to get some extra funding to cover this award? I am very happy, Mr Speaker, to pay tribute to the work done at the Pendleside Hospice and to hospices around the country. I think it is important that we see hospices as a very important element in a spectrum of palliative care and care at the end of end of life that takes place sometimes in a hospice setting, sometimes in other settings. My right honourable friend, the Health Secretary, will of course now be considering with the NHS leadership how to deliver on the ambitious long term funding arrangement that the Government recently announced. I am sure he will bear the Honourable Lady's comments in mind. back some of our money from the EU and regional aid. Much of that money was used and is used to invest in agri-food, something that I believe Cornwall is a world leader in. How will this investment be able to continue without falling foul of state aid rules in this sector when the government has signed has said there will be a common rule book? Uh, Mr Speaker, I confirm that any investment <coughs> which is legally able to be made within state aid rules now would be able to continue in the future, and any United Kingdom funding for money currently received as EU regional aid would comply with those same state aid rules going forward. Smith. (laughs) Mr Speaker, (laughs) he's a good lad. Members of my family were either killed or badly injured working in the coal mines of the South Wales Valleys. We owe all of our miners a debt of gratitude. Yet in recent years, the Treasury has raked in billions from their 
pension scheme. So can the Chancellor meet with me, retired miners and Coalfield community MPs to fix this injustice? I think we certainly recognise the hard work and the incredible risks that miners took in the Honourable Gentleman's constituency and many others. The important thing about the uh, miners' pension scheme is that it should pay out all the promised benefits in full. My understanding is that the scheme is funded to do just that and that no former miner is going to lose out. Murad. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The UK and the US has a uniquely strong relationship when it comes to security and intelligence services, the results of which regularly save lives not only in the UK but across Europe. Could I ask that when our right honourable friend the Prime Minister meets with President Trump, he thanks him for that relationship and the results of it, but might also take the opportunity to share with him the many incidents which I know my right honourable friend sitting here knows about, where it is UK intelligence, UK security services that have saved lives in the US. Yeah. Um, my, my right honourable friend is absolutely correct. The intelligence sharing and other security cooperation that we have with the United States has saved lives in both countries. It is vital to both our interests that those relationships continue. Caroline Lucas. Mr Speaker, my constituents in Brighton are sadly used to chaos from GTR, but the last seven weeks have been a new level of rail hell. Since the GTR franchise is effectively run by the Department for Transport, will he shake up the government so it finally shows some action and leadership? Action in terms of restoring the Gatwick Express services at Preston Park, which have been inexplicably uh, slashed, and leadership in terms of getting rid of the hapless Transport Secretary. The Prime Minister has been reshuffling her cabinet over the last week. Could she reshuffle it a bit more and get that Transport Secretary replaced by... Dutch indeed. Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. As regards GTR, improvements are simply not happening quickly enough, despite assurances that the operators have given. We have launched a review of Govia Thameslink, which will report in the next few weeks. And if those findings show that Govia is at fault, we won't hesitate to take action, whether that is fines, restricting access to future franchises, or stripping them of the franchise. Passengers deserve far better than they are getting at the moment in terms of service, and we will hold those operators to account. Mr Speaker, Albania has one of the highest rates of honour killing in Europe. Will the government look very closely at the case of Mrs Emiliana Muka, who was staying in the constituency of the member for Norwich South, and now, thanks to the generosity of her therapist, is staying in South Norfolk in the therapist's own house to, to, re to reduce the risk of self-harm, and who, if she were deported to Albania, possibly as early as tomorrow, might be the victim of an honour killing. Um, Mr. Mr Speaker, um, obviously I don't know all the details of this case, but I'm aware that this is an issue which has brought together my honourable friend, the honourable member for Norwich South, and my honourable friend, the member for Mid Norfolk. Um, the Home Secretary or the Immigration Minister will be happy to meet with the honourable members concerned to discuss the case. Clive Lewis? The honourable gentleman is. Well. Well, a great self-denying ordinance on the part of the Honourable Gentleman. His question has been answered and therefore he's satisfied. If that were a template for the House as a whole, just think of the possibilities. Laura Smith. Mr Speaker, can the Minister explain what the Prime Minister's Brexit proposals would mean for those working for two of the largest employers in my constituency, Bentley Motors and the NHS? Yeah. 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 It, would, it would be very good news for both of them, and uh, particularly you know, the automotive industry has been arguing for many months that we need to get a deal that ensures frictionless trade uh, with the EU27. That is what the model we are proposing will deliver. Neil O'Brien. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I strongly welcome the extra £20 billion for the NHS and the long-term plan for the NHS. But will the First Minister agree with me that at a time when local authority budgets are under pressure, it would be attractive to have more pooling of budgets between health and social care? It's, it's very important that the National Health Service and local authorities work closely together to ensure that community-based care, funded from whichever source, is effective and meets patients' needs. That is something that I know the new Health Secretary, like his predecessor, is determined to take forward further. Dennis Skinner! Yeah. 
is the Minister aware that already his government have taken more than £3.5 billion out of the miners' pension? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They like Philip Green and Maxwell put together. Stop stealing the miners' pension. Yeah. Mr. Mr Speaker, the benefits due from the pension scheme to all former miners have, as I understand it, been paid in full, continue to be paid in full, and the scheme is fully funded to meet those commitments into the future. Order! 